Hello, and uh, first of all, a very warm welcome to Steve and Sayla uh, that I have invited here to um, discuss training and sensitive stones and what are they used for and how you define them. Very warm welcome, Stephen. Well, thank you. Uh, nice to be speaking to you and you're in Copenhagen. I'm in, in uh, Christiansand, probably a little bit more snowy here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, an, an active American in Norway. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've lived here so many years. I think I'm half Norwegian now. Yeah, but I won't um, I won't claim you for that uh, so on. But uh, you have a great passion for endurance sport and cycling like me. So yeah. uh, therefore, I thought it would be really nice to discuss this. Uh, it's a part of a, a, a book that we wrote in... Uh, science and practice and the interaction between that and I guess that it's also what you have dedicated much of your research to is this uh, interaction and studying how uh, do elite athletes actually train and in that um, area how do they define different training intensities and of course this is important so but I I really liked the, your chapter and when I read it uh, I, I started to get convinced of maybe an improved use of the of the training stones and, and how they were defined because you could always say okay the body different system doesn't know so the heart will respond to one kind of, of stress and the muscle to another uh, but i really like the the chapter so i thought it would be really good to uh, to give the the listeners an insight into your thoughts yeah well let's go for it yeah so this is where you you so to say um explain and also why you have divided into five stones versus the three stones and maybe you could just take us through the basic of the physiology behind this right so if we start with a three zone model which is kind of it's the one that's most physiologically defensible and historically what we've seen in, in what the science literature the you have these three reasonably straightforward and definable breakpoints. You have the first lactate turn point, LT1. Uh, it can also be measured using ventilatory changes, and then it's called VT1. And, and then in that kind of the lower boundary for what we would call the threshold region, uh, which is Z2 in this picture. And then the upper boundary for that is the so-called second lactate turn point. It's often a more distinct increase in blood lactate again it can also be shown with ventilation and ventilation and lactate are linked because the ventilation is largely driven by the need to get rid of co2 uh, so so there's a there's a mechanistic connection between when we breathe more and also when we're producing more lactate so that can that helps under, us understand that so and then the third the third break point or or uh, demarcation is just VO2 max. Yeah. And so those we can measure in the lab. Now you might ask, well, which of them is the most important from a training perspective? I would argue it's LT1, uh, but we'll talk a little bit more about why that's true because of stress responses that begin to, to develop once you cross that LT1. So, so those are the three zones, but then in a coaching scenario, very often, you know, particularly in high performance athletes, zone one is very big or it's very broad. And so it's useful to uh, pedagogically, you might say, to break that up perhaps into zone one and zone two. But that that distinction is kind of what I would call arbitrary. There's not a very there's not a set of very clear rules that say, well, this is where Z1 ends. And this is where Z2 begins in that five zone model. Yeah. What, and this, what is your ex, uh, experience there? Is it something that coaches, because in my, when I coach, I mean, I, I don't care whether it's zone one or two. I think that what is important is that when you, so to have, need the base and also what we have, the high volume, the important is that you are to the left of the LT1. Because I mean, if you go in the middle, then you end up that it gets a mess. But I don't right. care that much if people go a little easier and it becomes zone one. But yeah. you see coaches that define and say, okay, it's important that this session you keep in zone one and not in the lower part of zone two because I think it's it's sometimes difficult to um, 
fifty percent cheaper. Right, I, I think that's true, and, and it's it's very. I, I can see the issue when you're working with world class athletes that have an incredibly broad zone, you know, that that below LT one, so they yeah. can get way up the intensity scale before they actually show that first lactate breakpoint. But most recreational athletes and and lower level, you know, p- performers that's not the problem the problem will tend to be that they will drift up and that zone one the green will become yellow as you yeah. as you mentioned so, yeah. uh, so so we just have to remember that uh, that that some big stress response types of things ha- begin to happen when we cross over into that uh, yellow zone and that's that's why we're fairly careful on that um, Whereas the distinction between yellow and red is is actually more fuzzy, you might say, in the sense that, you know, you can start in threshold with a threshold session and end up pretty quickly or pretty easily drifting into, you know, heart rates and blood lactates that look more like uh, the red zone. Yeah. So so then if we go to the past the yellow and go to the zone four and five, it also seems very useful for coaches when they're prescribing interval training to kind of be able to distinguish between kind of just above zone, that threshold zone, you know, about 90% of heart rate max, for example, versus trying to really go all the way to to very close to VO2 max. And what we see is that, that most of our endurance athletes, when we look at their training data, they are choosing to do more work in that zone four area and not very much training in zone five. And this is true even for sports like rowing, where they're competing in zone five and beyond. And and do you define this as heart rate or do you define it as power? Because I think that maybe for the heart rate, it could be that if you train a lot, then it's difficult to achieve your maximal heart rate. So it will tend to be slightly lower. Or is it also if you define it from power output? Yeah, it's it, it it depends a bit on the sport and what they have available, but but particularly, at least with heart rate, we we've seen that our athletes and also with lactate, they don't want to be in double digit lactates during their interval sessions. Okay. To put it that way, they want to you know they'll often be off, and we have to remember their 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 fiber type is is very conducive to you know keeping lactate low. But our best athletes with eighty plus VO two max and so forth they're accumulating many minutes in zone four. They might do like Olaf Tufta when he won two gold medals, his favorite workout was six times 10 minutes. Yeah. So that's, and that was a zone four type of workout, zone three up to four, but they don't do a whole lot of zone five. And the, and the reason seems to be the, the, the general consensus that's developed is, is those workouts that where you push a lot into zone five take longer to recover from. And, and so this starts to touch on what these zones maybe are good for is to try to help balance the signal that we're trying to generate because we want to generate signals for adaptation, but we want to generate those signals, you might say, as cheaply as possible from a systemic stress level, if that makes sense. So we want to get molecular signals, but we want to, we want to manage the stress responses so that our athletes recover from day to day reasonably well. And the good thing is that you can stimulate a lot of factors of importance for VO2 max, even though you don't go to VO2 max. Uh, absolutely. And I think that's unfortunately been a, a misunderstanding by many uh, that you have to do super high intensity intervals to improve your VO2 max. The, the data just does not support that at all. And uh, it's clear that in practice, many people go for some kind of functional test if they want to determine their LT2. Uh, and yeah. that, what we have started using and what's most simple is to actually mention the ventilation threshold because if you plot ventilation divided by VO2, you can easily define the VT1. And if you divide by VC2, the, the VT2. Uh, but it's a little bit more fussy with the lactate. I mean, there's been all of these. I think there was Copen who said there was like 40 different ways of identifying them. But I mean, they they end up in the same area, and I 
uh, but uh, but how do you do it in practice if you want to do it? Let's say you want to monitor an athlete where you might not have access to a, a lab protocol to define the zone. Right. Well, I've worked a bit with some you know professional cycling, and this is a big issue because they're out in the field and they're using a handheld devices, and so part of it is being very consistent on your methodology, even learning how to to you know get the drop of blood and and avoid sweat and any all these small issues because it is a technical you just have to be technically proficient uh, for one thing now the other thing is is that technology is kind of helping us or pushing us in a in a direction where i think we will uh, we're already doing ventilatory threshold type measurements using wearables in the field uh, you know, if we can measure ventilatory uh, frequency and relative volume changes using a stretch receptor type of uh, method, you know, where we're literally mechanically able to measure what the, the, the breathing frequency and the, and the amount of excursion of the lungs, we're getting good data and we're able to get really nice ventilatory threshold uh, you know, with, with just the typical ramp protocol. So maybe in the, in, you know, what I think what's going to be coming is that our teams will be able to move away a bit from lactate if we want to, um, and be able to use the ventilatory thresholds, um, if, if that's desirable. So, so it's a, but it's a process, it's a technological process and it has to be user friendly and so forth. So, but I, but I'm seeing really good because you could say if you use it as at least like you could say, okay, if you, you miss interpreted or you think it's, it's higher, go higher could be at least uh, detrimental. On the other hand, most athletes have a good impression of where the problems are. Well, and, and I think the most common mistake that that non-elite athletes and recreational performers do is they overestimate because there's kind of this mentality that higher is better and I want to just be able to use a higher number. And But that's that shouldn't be the goal. The goal is to say, well, let's make sure I get this training distribution right so that I stay healthy, I stay, I'm recovering because the overlap on the actual training adaptations between small differences in power are very small. Uh, so, so the more likely, the most likely problem we see will always be the athletes do the easy too hard and then the hard workouts they're not recovered enough for and they are not quality, you know, so everything moves towards the middle. That is of course the major issue if you push your base too much into the, you know, so that's right. That's right. If we go and, to maybe the next slide that uh, we took here, uh, let's see if we can shift. Uh, we took because I, I wanted to show some real data, and both of yours, where you have uh, calculated it from your 2004 papers in Skiers, and where you saw this uh, very nice uh, polarized uh, distribution, whereas in cyclists, they tend to be more in the yellow because when you, I guess, both if you use uh, heart rate to do it, but also if you use power output, there's more of a fluctuation and then you may accumulate more time in yellow, even though you have the intention to uh, to aim for the polarized uh, right. approach. Well, and they, they have these long climbs and, and there's, you know, there's a number of different things in cycling. They also have much longer workouts. Yeah. Uh, they tend to still do single workouts. So the a four hour, five hour, even six hour training session will, uh, will, will have some, the so-called efforts that are integrated into the workout. So compared to maybe rowers, cross country skiers, the, the cyclists tend to be, now this is not true for all, all the teams and all the athletes, but they tend to have a bit more of a mix of intensities, uh, in their training sessions. But it's still a lot of low intensity, as you can see here. Yeah. Uh, but they they may have more threshold. Does that matter, or does that mean that it's wrong? I, I don't think so. I think what's really critical is that distinction between green versus yellow plus red. I kind of see it as more binary these days, if that makes sense. Yeah, and maybe also if your threshold is very high, you could say, okay, you can still get a very high cardiovascular. Uh, stimulus from the yellow zone, whereas if, if your threshold is lower, uh, 
right. percentage of you to max, then that type of training may have little effect on the cardiovascular system. Yeah, and, and we have to remember these these athletes that are pictured here, their their threshold is is around ninety percent, uh, you know, of the of heart rate max. Yeah. So it's a they are exceptionally uh, capable or exceptionally well trained. So yeah, I think that's part of the issue uh, that that where threshold and zone that red zone they kind of tend to merge more a little in the in the high performance athlete population but both in your 2004 and now people here still use the three zone model instead of the five would that still be your preferred so if you had to analyze let's say a given practice and go on you still tend to use this or would you still prefer the more uh, detailed zones for this type of, of study well i think i think both are you know this is more, I, I, I want to say physiologically clean, uh, because those are demarcations that we can, we can, we can explain from a, some kind of a mechanistic, you know, standpoint and understanding muscle recruitment, understanding what's happening. Why is blood lactate? Why are we seeing this transitional point from, you know, one millimolar up to 1.8 and then two and so forth. And so from that standpoint, it's cleaner for me as a physiologist, it's defensible. But, yeah. but again, there are some details that I think coaches and athletes understand and have developed their understanding of that the, the scientists are still trying to figure out. And that, for example, this issue of, of high intensity interval training that the, the, uh, the, the, high, the performers, the athletes are, have understood that, well, we can get the same adaptations if we go a bit easier. In other words, zone four, you know, holding back a little bit, but but doing more minutes. So we're doing a bit more, a longer sessions. We're, uh, but we recover better from that. Yeah, um, and that's also developed a lot of these. I mean, uh, what Ben Drenister has done with these uh, 30, 15 uh, seconds on, uh, 30 seconds on, 15. I mean, you can mix it up in a lot of ways that will allow you to accumulate more time uh, with a high power output and a high uh, heart rate, maybe without over exhausting. Your... Right, and 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 you have to also. It's also useful to kind of remember that the central point of view versus the peripheral point of view. If we think of it that way, let's take a thirty fifteen type interval session. When you look at that session three times, it's essentially, you know, three times uh, ten minutes, for example. Um, it's from a central point of view, the interval set, the intervals are 10 minutes long. Yeah. But from a peripheral point of view, there are differences in recruitment, muscle motor unit recruitment from, you know, between the 30 and the 15s and so forth. So uh, I do think that's an interesting, you know, it, it's more perhaps for, for cyclists and some athletes that are doing a lot of stochastic work, it can be a very useful way to, to train it, at times. Yeah. And it actually comes to this uh, the figure from uh, from one of your presentations, this triangulation of the way you can monitor. You can take it from the RPE, perceived exertion perspective. You can monitor external workout. I guess the power output from the cyclist is the most used, but also pacing, running, and so on. And then you can look at the physiological perspective. Uh, right. Heart, where you can the heart rate is easiest, and you can measure some metabolic uh, factors, which is so to say the internal cost. And of course, there you can have the mix because if you consider this thirty uh, seconds, then you could say, okay, the, the the power output on the muscle is even in this that is zone five or maybe bit zone six beyond the view to max in in terms of intensity. But of course, the internal uh, response uh, on the heart is in zone four, but on the muscular, some of it is during the exercise period is, is in the higher. So that is, of course, where it mixes up. Yeah. And, and, and the other thing is we're, we're trying to use this triangulation model to help coaches and athletes monitor themselves and make good decisions across time. You know, am I getting fatigued? Is the cost, the internal cost during the workout becoming excessive? You know, because it it's not static. Uh, if we start out at, at an interval, you know, above LT1 and we're doing, 
uh, uh, kind of a threshold session. Well, the internal costs will, will just keep getting higher and higher as, as that session progresses. So that's one thing we want to measure is what's happening in the workout. But then we want to also look across time how this internal cost to external work relationship is changing. And is it changing in a, in a positive way or is it changing in a, a negative way, meaning that the athlete's becoming tired, the brakes are coming on to the autonomic nervous system, for example, heart rate is too low, uh, or it can be too high. So we have to have a tool, we have to have a set of tools for distinguishing these different kinds of changes. And, and unfortunately, some athletes and their coaches will tend to become quite fascinated with one way of measuring either heart rate or power you know or rpe but i don't i think that's a bit dangerous because each of these methods individually have weaknesses they they have yeah. holes in the in the in their ability to diagnose or to demonstrate what's going on but if you put them together it's like a doctor getting a second opinion or a patient getting a second opinion you're getting extra information um, and you can no, connect no, I, them so that's that's that what we try to what we try to achieve here yeah I, I saw actually that there was a poll who said, oh, if you could measure one thing, RPE, lactate, heart rate, or power output, which would it be? And and I mean, it makes no sense because, I mean, let's say you have an athlete saying, oh, this is 17 very hard. If you have no idea if that is for um, external power output of uh, of 100 watts or 400, I mean, it makes no sense. Right. But the other way around, I mean, so... But yeah. you don't have to measure all three every day. I think one of the things we see... Uh, historically is these really good endurance athletes become exceptionally well calibrated. I, I remember one of my colleagues, he did a lot of lactate testing at altitude camps in the rower, among the rowers. And he said they were, they could tell me within a couple of tenths of a, a, a millimole on their lactate where they were. Yeah. They could feel it. But that was because they had been tested. They had calibrated their perceptual feelings against the actual measurements many times and so they they were tuned in uh so they said oh i think i'm at about 3.4 you know and they would be but, at 3.5 you know it was but amazing. Now especially that when you mention altitude but also uh, with uh, with heat that is one of the the issues where it actually changed the uh, the correlation between the two because i mean if you go to altitude right. your power or your power zones will go markedly down but your heart rate your cardiovascular response can still be altered from that and reverse for, you could say, likewise for heat. I mean, it can drive off the cardiovascular response out of proportion to the to the power output. Right, and that's again; those are situations where the error will tend to be that they'll go too hard. So I know in Norway, when we do altitude camps, that is when they do the most lactate measurements, and they're trying to make sure the athlete goes easy. Yeah at least in the first days, because those initial days at altitude are a huge transition, a huge stress on the body. And so they will be exceptionally careful uh, to try to make sure that the, the, they're just getting a lot of altitude exposure. They're getting low intensity training many hours, but they don't want to go too hard. Uh, and I think heat adaptation is kind of the same as that the power outputs go way down uh, and you have to just let the body have some some exposures before you even think about you know a, a big intensity uh, yeah. shift. And that is where the RPE also gets out because in the start you may not have the same kind of clues. I mean, as you said, a top athlete they will know when they are on the threshold they can make mention that they have drift in their their response. But if they then have some kind of perturbation of this, then. Yeah. Be that they don't get the same, same types of, of, uh, of clues there. So, so when we're in doubt, we're going to be, we're going to be conservative. Yeah. You might say, we're not going to, we're not going to push the boundaries harder because we're thinking about the long game for this athlete. Yeah. Now, I also like that you, uh, you included this one where you still to say, at even further zones, but you still to say, uh, included those who are, you could say anaerobic effort, short sprinting, longer sprinting, tolerance uh, training, and so on. Right. Uh, and maybe well, just go too much into that. I just wanted to challenge one point of them. I, I mean, you've just adapted this figure from the Norwegian Olympia top. Uh, right. But I think that 
peripheral muscle adaptation. There, there seems to be a tendency to say, okay, all it is all of this volume at low intensities, but I mean, at least we see that for capillarization, the stimuli having that high intensity, at least that's part of the training. Uh, uh, I, I would say that the body of the bacteria is spread all over, so you're covered in the figure, but I think that the, 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 the mean of the diamond square, maybe that should be like for the cardiovascular system, a tendency for the high intensity to have a higher stimulus. Well, and that's what you see. The cardiovascular pump function, you know, I've kind of placed the the center of that adaptive strength in that zone four area, uh, or Olympia Taupin has versus the, you know, the peripheral adaptations. And, and again, this is connected to signaling as well, that we have these different signaling pathways, one being an energy related signaling pathway where we can look at the ratio between AMP and ATP, and then another being more of a calcium uh, calmodulin pathway that is, is, is essentially a volume pathway, just exposure of high, high calcium in the, in the in, in intracellular environment. So there seems to be mechanistically at the, at, the, at the signaling level, some defense for that there are different pathways, there are different intensities that, you know, but they overlap. Yeah. And so I it think, also matters if it is the metabolic, it's quite clear that your fat oxidation is, is higher in zone two. That started already to decline when you go into uh, zone three. But then there could be the interaction that you also, as you mentioned, with the cyclists, they do the long rides, then they have intensity parts in between. They use carbohydrates there, they cut their muscle glycogen, and then they actually increase fat oxidation even more than if they do only the steady state session. Right. So I, I think there's a reason why athletes don't just do one thing. So the, yeah. this argument or this discussion of zone two or zone four or whatever, that's not what athletes do. They have naturally self-organized over many decades to understand that they need both stimuli. And I probably, I would argue that those two stimuli, the, the, the volume at low intensity and then the work at higher intensity, they, they generate a virtuous cycle uh, that they, they, it's kind of self-strengthening and, and that we're, we're maintaining, for example, blood volume, we're maintaining high stroke volume and high cardiac output and, and buffering capacity, which allows us to then do these other types of sessions. And then the base, the capillary density, the mitochondrial density helps facilitate the ability to tolerate high intensity. So it's a virtuous cycle uh, that if, if we find the right balance, but then that balance issue is about stress. It's about managing the stress responses. I think that's what I've kind of learned over the last 25 years of trying to understand, well, why, why do we see this distribution? Why do we see this intensity distribution? And it seems to be that it is a, it, we're, we're trying to balance signal and stress. No, but I also think there's been this embracing of the stone too. Oh, it's the stone too that yeah, makes yeah. It good and so on. I think that as also, as you mentioned, what is important is that when athletes are aware that they actually place their base training, their high volume into the zone two rather than in the lower part of the zone three, is that it allows them to have this volume of training, but it also allows them to have continuity and to do the high sessions. Whereas the if you go too hard on the easy sessions, you don't go hard enough on the hard sessions. Right. And the other, the other thing I always try to remind people of, because the discussions tend to always migrate towards just thinking about intensity and the intensity zones. But we have to remember that intensity does not live in a vacuum. There is no real understanding of intensity without putting a duration on that intensity. Oh, right. Exactly. And so... I, I so a zone one workout for a high performance athlete cyclist may last five hours. A zone two session might be only three hours. So, so there's a, there's an interplay between intensity and duration, both at low, at the low intensity range, but also of course at the high intensity range where I was discussing zone four versus zone five. Well, the, the same is true for zone one versus zone two, that there's going to be an interaction between intensity and duration. Yeah. 
And that is also why I like your figure here, where you have this interaction between the bays that allows you to have this uh, continuity in this. And you can always discuss which comes first. Is it more important to have intensity in your training than to have volume? But as you also indicate here, all of them interact. Yeah, yeah they do. And, and, and what we see, at least if I'm going to make a, a, an argument, I would say that when you ask a, a high, an athlete that stand, has stood on the podium and just won and they ask, well, what was the key to your success? And they will, they will not say, well, it was this epic workout I did or this, this perfect training protocol or camp, or camp. But they'll say, well, I stayed healthy. I was able to do the work. You know, I've had a number of months of really good training. The frequency of training was where I wanted it to be. So it's a, it's often they're, what they're describing is a long game. They're describing that they've had continuity, as you show here, and they've gotten that balance right over many weeks or, or, or several months. And when they achieve that, good things tend to happen. And that is maybe where the, the importance of being aware of your zones and being aware when is that I have to be in a certain zone and maybe compromise going all out instead of keeping the intensity at something that I that is sustainable. That is maybe that that will allow them to stay healthy, continue and go on. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've you know some of the top coaches, uh, Calvin Nall from that's worked with so many Kenyans. You know, he said, look, sometimes. The Kenyan runners just f suddenly decide that they're going to turn a training session into a kind of a really hot, hard effort. They push harder than normal, and they're just enjoying it. They're just driven by their their uh, their mo their joy of training hard. And he says that's fine, but then we'll have to make adjustments the the, the following days. So as long as is there's an understanding of that process that if I do you know, if I go super hard and race and push myself to the absolute limits, then probably I have to make some adjustments in the, in the, in the days following, then we can stay in balance. Yeah, no, I think that's an important point because also if you lose the, 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 the stochastic, but because I mean, doing racing, as you said, well, it's skiing, cycling, maybe to a lesser intense, the very long runs, but I mean, even a 10 uh, kilometer run, I mean, it's, it is varying intensities. And I mean, a runner should be able to cope with that. So also the good uh, old Swedish part leg, where yeah. you yeah. stay played with. I mean, I, I actually, when I have a, when I do uh, training planning, I have one session of that because I mean, that's part of, uh, of being able to mix up the intensities and being able to self uh, adjust your pace. But then Absolutely. you should, of course, know that if that part lap translate into being a very hard session, then as you said, then you need to be able to uh, to adjust the subsequent yeah. uh, training sessions. So, so there's really no there's no such thing as too hard of a workout. You know that you can do the body can tolerate very hard sessions, but it's just about balancing over time and allowing for recovery. Yeah. Uh, and and so. But but it, we've seen over many years that it, it probably doesn't pay to do too much of the really hard. You know, you, you've got to, because they do cost a lot. Yeah. One thing that I've been speculating about this uh, distribution where you in the, in the skiers ended up that they had like 80% in the base and 20% up in the high intensity. Yeah. Is that just that you can tell it? Because when we then see that people who have very large training volumes that we saw for the case here with the, the Giro cyclists, then it tends to be only 10 or 15%. Is that because you can tolerate a certain amount of, of, of that and then the distribution becomes slightly, if you have a higher total volume? And or is it that it's a difference between sports, that in some sports you will have this distribution, whereas in, in others that tends to be more of the lower intense? Well, I think this is a good question to, to end with, or, but maybe we could have started with it. And that is, what do we actually mean when we talk about 80-20 or polarized? What are we polarizing? Is it heart time and zone and the heart rate? Is it the power distribution? I would say what it really is, is it's the it's training days. Because each day, if we really think about it, each day, once we turn on a big stress response, that day is is kind of used up or it is it we will need more recovery time because we're on a 24-hour cycle 
that yeah. essentially on average, we need to be recovered every 24 hours. Now, at times that will not be true after a really hard race, after a hard interval session, then we may need 48 hours or 72 hours uh, or even more. If it was a world, you know, a marathon championship race, it may be days and days before you're fully recovered from that effort. And, and running has, in, in addition to the, the metabolic stress, the, the autonomic nervous system stress, you have the mechanical stress that's very high. So I think what we're seeing is athletes end up dividing their sessions or their, their it's days, it's high stress days and it's more low stress days, just doing the work. So they'll do volume, low intensity on some days and then on certain days they are doing high stress. And, you know, we've had the example of say the Ingebrigtsens where they might've had a race, you know, a 1500 meter race early in the season where they've gone through a, a, a heavy warm up, they've done the high intensity, and they say, well, we've turned on this high intensity stress response, but we really haven't done very much work because it was just the one 1500 meter race. So then they they would go back out on the track after the, the, the meet was finished and they would do an interval session. Yeah. Just no, because no, they say- Because as you said, in, in running, the, 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 the limitating factor can be otherwise than for cycling. I used to say in cycling, the volume you can tolerate is amount of how much energy can you consume. In uh, running, it can be the amount of eccentric work uh, that right. you tolerate. But what's interesting, because you'll see a range, typical run, distance runners may be doing 550 hours a year of, of actual running, something like that. It's in the 500, 600 range. It's not a thousand. Whereas our, our cross-country skiers, rowers, swimmers can be a thousand plus and, and we're seeing swimming and triathlon they're hitting 1300 hours of training uh, but they're spreading it across different modalities there's a lot of it is non there's no uh, uh, eccentric load so it does seem to be very much a function of the mechanical loading that determines the the tolerance for volume but what's interesting is is even across that big range in total volume they still are all kind of landing on this fairly high that a big percentage of it will be low intensity yeah no no because also if the intensity is lower of course the the, the eccentric load for each stride will of course also be, be limiting and so on right so so that's you know i always i talk when i first started doing all this research i thought well i i suspected that there would be bigger differences in the way these different groups train the skiers versus the rowers versus the runners but it turns out there's some fairly significant universal principles that that we see repeated but then there are some details that you know at the at the mechanical loading level also the technical you know the kayak paddlers sometimes will say that it's very difficult for them to do zone one and still have a nice uh, the, the right force signature in their stroke so they tended to ease towards zone two when they were doing their low intensity. That was Eric Varos Larsen, for example, a gold medalist from the Norway. He said he, he struggled with that. He had to often go a little bit harder just to make sure that the technical signature, you, you know, the force signature was correct. No, no, exactly. And, and for rowing, that's a big issue because what they do when they lower the intensity is that they lower the cadency. Because right. they want to have the technique in each stroke. Whereas in cycling, it's the other way around. You keep your cadency and then you lower the force. Uh, so, of course, yeah. it's force specific how you do these things. But, but as you said, what I think is interesting is also how different sports should accept their, their unique and what is the, the limitating factors here of cats that know how. But I also think that the clever coaches, they can have this outreach so they can get inspired from other disciplines or from your work and saying, okay, you can actually see it in this way in that sport, so that would signify that right. that maybe you should. Uh, I mean, in cycling, for example, there was this big oh, people were afraid of going into say uh, uh, so the red zone because then you have high lactate. But if you then start and study some of the rowers, and you can see oh, they can have this many times a week, then you can see okay, of course you can adapt to this. Of course, when you then go back to your cycling, it's a matter of trying to. Uh, not to overdo it, but find the, the fine balance to say, okay, it's not dangerous to go into that zone, but of course you should not be in that zone for an extensive or uh, too much uh, right. period of no, time. No, I think that's, 
One of the big issues, you know, I think one of the advantages that Norway has had is they man they managed to agree on a intensity zone system where everybody could speak together, where the rowers could speak with the skiers and the skiers could talk to the swimmers because they at least have a fairly consistent language. You know, when they say zone one yeah. in the Norwegian model, everyone agrees on what that means fairly well. Uh, and, and so communication is always the starting point for that cross that cross fertilization you're talking about where the different coaches and athlete groups can can learn from each other they for that to happen you have to have kind of a common language uh, and and so that's been at least one advantage we've seen from the Olympia Tulpen work that you know they put a big effort into uh, agreeing on an intensity scale yeah no no I'm back to the start from this talk uh, your your chapter in the book I think that uh, that is where it made a, a really good, uh, and, or, and we can recommend it. Uh, we have no economic uh, no. <laughs> uh, deal on this, so we can recommend it fully to read this, uh, the, buy the book, uh, and read this chapter because I think it. And I, I mean, making it uh, a common uh, because sometimes you read, oh, I do a lot of zone three, and okay, do you mean zone three as right. in, uh, in red zone, or do you mean zone uh, three as in the five zone models, and so on? But right. when I met you, I thought, okay, this makes a really good basic for people to talk together. And then you can, of course, say, okay, how much should the different zones be valued and so on, and or where yeah. it, uh, the given. But that's well, why I commend this, uh, this chapter a lot to uh, to people uh, dig into it. And uh, well, Lars, you wrote a chapter in that book as well, and and I and I I think we both can say we the only thing we got out of the deal was a free book. Or maybe two. Uh, so the the scientific joy of the, of me. Oh, absolutely. So I I fun. would just say I can absolutely without any reservation recommend the book to to listeners to you know students to athletes. I know you know I would say it's one of the best investments they'll make uh, because there are so many great chapters that will help. Like whether it's on heat or or altitude or uh, you know intensity or, or interval training. So uh, it's a wonderful book. I was proud to be a part of it, uh, and it definitely challenged me, and I know you were challenged as well, to try to really put together, you know, a big amount of knowledge and squeeze it into one chapter. So I think it, it challenged us. Well, but uh, it was a real pleasure uh, to discuss or yes. talk some of this, and then hopefully it will spread even further uh, out uh, while we the system. So uh, I will link to the book. Uh, I already have done, but also to some of the publications that we included in this one, uh, some of them, of course. Right. Thanks Excellent. a lot.